hit the topic. If you, uh, I, mean, I mean, if you turn on the news, that's just what's playing. That is what's hot right now. And it, it's unfortunate because you, you think with all the protesting, all that's gone on with, with COVID, the lockdown, it's really obvious to anyone, even, even neutrals, looking at what's going on. And yet the same thing is repeated again and again. It's like, how are, how are black people still getting shot? It, I mean, is there not enough press coverage on this topic? It, it, it's still getting repeated. It's kind of insane. Well, it's, it's definitely, uh, you know, I think that, you know, these are systems, right, that are being put into place, that have been put in place for, for decades, for maybe hundreds of years. And it's going to take a lot more than just some publicity to reverse the system, you know? Yeah. But I mean, where does it, I mean, where does it end? I mean, where does, where, it's interesting because after all of the protesting, after, you know, it's been months now. Mm -hmm. And yet we're still kind of facing the same issue. What can be done? I mean, from the, from the perspective of the protester, the person who's out there, you know, maybe not even every day, but every once in a while, it has literally been months of participation within the peaceful political process, exercising the First Amendment right to, you know, march and, you know, protest peacefully what's going on. But, you know, people have marched in the streets, people have taken knees, you know, obviously there's no NBA playoffs right now. Yeah. Like, People are making their voices heard, yet the laws have not changed. And when you watch things like the RNC, I don't know if you've tuned in. I personally haven't just, you know, watched highlight clips and whatnot. It's, a, it's, a, hard. it's an experience. It's not even addressed. The issue yeah, well, they, addressed. I think on the first night, I don't know if you saw this, but on the first night, they brought on some black speakers to talk about Donald Trump's record with black people. And I thought, I thought that was hilarious how on the first night they went to using props. Like it, it really showed how desperate the party has become to not be labeled what they've become, which right. is sort of a white nationalist group at the end of the day, unfortunately. Uh -huh. That's uh -huh. kind of where the Republican Party is aligned itself with. And it's, it's unfortunate because I know not all Republicans are racist, but when you stand by and let racist things happen yeah it is tacit racism absolutely complicity, complicity. uh yeah. there's there was uh a really so two things that that came to mind for me um the first was a really great democracy now piece i saw you know how they're releasing all the these in uh because of covid right because covid is spreading in prisons and jails so California has been releasing hundreds of people who have been incarcerated. And what that's doing now is, you know, for, for years, California has pressed into labor incarcerated people to battle wildfires over the summer, where they forced incarcerated people to work for a dollar an hour to fight the wildfires. And they now have a labor shortage, too few, too little slave labor to press into, in, press into service to combat these wildfires. And what's doubly uh, painful is the fact that after you're incarcerated in California, you can't get EMT certification. That's the law. So after you have all this experience battling fires, you can't get hired to work for a fire department at, once you get released. That's baffling. I, I saw a little bit of that story as well while watching the highlights mm -hmm. a couple of days ago. And I... I just don't have any words for that. It's just, it's another shining light on systemic corruption within an individual state's government. Obviously these problems don't just fall within California, but because of the issues that they're facing with the wildfires, it's, it's only exacerbated the exposition of the overall problem. I mean, like you said, they were paying prisoners a dollar an hour to go fight wildfires as a prisoner someone who's held against your will what i mean a dollar an hour is not going to make you get out of bed why you know what was the thought behind that you know well apparently it up? saves it saves the state of california 100 million dollars a year to have this service 
Um, Understandably, but you get you get what you paid for, and now half the state's on fire. Right. Uh, second thing that I I was reading about was, um, you know, I I I, I don't know. I, I I'm really wondering like what your thoughts are on this because, you know, I I think with any kind of um, with any, you know with what's happening in Kenosha, Wisconsin, with any kind of uh, flare up of, I think, righteous rage and righteous anger it, and, and sort of how it's being expressed in Kenosha, where you have peaceful protests mixed with acts of shooting, acts of violence against protesters mixed with some stores being broken into. I read this article in the New York Times about where they interviewed some independents in Wisconsin who were saying that the unrest on their streets in Kenosha was making them lean more towards Trump. So mm. I just wonder, you know, where, what is that what, what do you think of that? And, and, you know, what does that do for Biden's chances in, in November? It's, it's interesting because I think it puts Biden at a, in a good position to, to be on the right side of history and to give explanation to those that maybe don't understand the issues yet. Not like it's not been talked about time and time again, but those who are still in the, on the middle of the fence um, you know, Biden is in a unique position to unite those people and say, hey, um, you know, I do stand in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement, although I don't agree that rioting is the right necessarily means of expressing discontent with the system. It is understandable under these circumstances when no other means of protest have had any dramatic effect on change. Yeah. And so, you know, Biden's in a really unique position to say my administration will have an open ear to these demands. We will listen to you. And at the same time, we understand how some people may feel threatened by this movement and explain to them that these are movements based on the discontent from generational inequality that's been systematically designed within America to really strip the American dream from African Americans. Do you think though that there's, do you think that this is maybe a place where the Biden campaign, if they really do feel like the, uh, let's say the, the, the visuals or the, whatever, the image of people breaking into stores is really hurting Biden's chances. Do you think that this is a opportunity for them to negotiate with members of Black Lives Matter, with leaders within Black Lives Matter to say, you know, if, if you can make sure that these are all peaceful marches, we will 100% put this into our platform or something. I mean, these sorts of negotiations would happen during the Kennedy administration between Kennedy and Martin Luther King. I mean, I think it's, it's an interesting idea, but honestly, at the end of the day, unlike within the 60s, even during the civil rights movement, although Martin Luther King was a you know strong figurehead within the movement that did have a lot of sway and his his voice was definitely heard, but unlike that, you know Black Lives Matter doesn't really have a central figure that's giving command or even offering advice. Number one, number two, the leaders of the organization are so unknown, and it's it's the marches are not as necessarily organized. I don't want to take away from their organizational skills, but there's no centralized leadership within the movement itself. And so I think it would be folly to think from a governor or from a government perspective that talking with the leadership of this organization would guarantee, I guess, the everyone kind of playing it safe. You know, they don't they don't really control everyone who's at these rallies. Mm. People new people join the rallies all the time. And so, you know, if a new person's at the rallies or, you know, marching peacefully in the streets and they're met with tear gas, as so many are, and that person doesn't respond peacefully, that's not the responsibility of the Black Lives Matter organization. That's, you know, that's human nature <laughs> to, to respond to threat of violence. So, I mean, mm -hmm. it, I think it would be a good show of faith, but ultimately how effective it would be, I question. I mean, it's, I, I think you're, you're, what you're saying is exactly right. I, I, I also feel like in, in Kenosha, the New York Times wrote about how that district, that uh, county, Hillary lost it by 250 votes. And, you know, of course, Wisconsin was one of the states that 
uh, led her to lose the electoral college. So I just feel like this is the system that we have. It's, it's racist, it's explicitly anti, anti-poverty, it's explicitly anti-black, but this is the system that we have. And uh, I, I, just, I just, you know, that's, that's kind of what I'm reacting to right now. And it's unfortunate because it, it's, it's really funny. You watch some of the um, attack ads on Joe Biden from the right, and they say, you know, um, there's going to be defunding of the police. There's going to be riots in the street. There's going to be, you know, it's, it's a lot of fear mongering, whereas they're using footage from things that are already happening right now in Trump's America. And mm. when you watch the Republican National Convention, you see a complete kind of um ignorance of it's like it's like the mind right mind white for men in black it's like they put the flashlight to you and they hold it up and they click it and then you forget everything it's it's almost reminiscent of the french revolution when the nobles were just kind of letting them eat cake pretending everything was cool when literally the nation is burning we're uh-huh. damn near at civil war and the issues aren't being addressed by one major political party so, I mean, it's, it's interesting because for anyone that would want change, there's only really one logical option. It's going to be the person that is at least willing to come to the table and listen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that's a lot to digest, uh, but I think we should bring on our guests now. Um, yeah. <laughs> let's, please, let's please bring on uh, Ryan Bledsoe. Ryan... Uh, runs RT Industry and is also the founder of Full Spectrum Solutions Group. Ryan, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks guys for having us today. Uh, and you're also with your wife, Tia, as well. Yes, this is Tia. Hello, Hi, Tia. Tia. Hi. Um, We're Ryan, always in a car. Yes. We're always in a car. Do you want to say what you're doing in a car? Uh, yeah. Like we you're going are... to pick up the, yeah. Yep, we found a motorcycle on a motorcycle uh, web page, and so we're going up to take a look at it for my son, which is in the back back there on his phone. But uh, <laughs> camping out. Yeah, camping out. And so he worked really hard and and has a good game plan to, for us to go take a look at this motorcycle for him. So we're uh, heading up the coast. Beautiful out here in Oregon. It's 60, 70 degrees. Mm. Uh, clear skies. Uh, unfortunately, Oregon's on fire too. So I felt oh. for you guys. Uh, yeah. With all the fires. So, but yeah, anyway, um, up here in Tillamook and uh, live in a beautiful place in Oregon. And we do cannabis here. Nice. <laughs> I, I, we're coming from Brooklyn, New York, Adiz in LA. We do cannabis in both of those places. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so maybe you, cannabis how did you not like rock in all this <laughs> you know maybe um how did you, you know, how did you come to uh how did you come to work in the cannabis industry <clears throat> um it was a really interesting story for us um my wife and i uh smoked recreationally and we were kind of joking around always that we smoke a lot of cannabis we should grow our own and we never really did because it was illegal and so we had other businesses and we you know replace safety features in cars and so uh, as we went down this road of you know cannabis we had to be quiet about it it wasn't quite out there yet so we ran across a, a situation where i had an eye injury and we found ourselves in portland oregon at the kci institute uh, in a hotel room and i was wondering to myself what am i going to do uh now i got to come up with a new career i can't quite do the stuff that i normally did which i still do so i didn't not that i lost it but when you have a major injury you 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 just your life flashes before your eyes and how you're going to provide for your family right it's just it's just right there so here we are we're in this hotel room and our governor governor kitzhopper comes on at the time and he says marijuana is going to be legal in oregon and i literally had a jerry Maguire moment and I was jumping up and down on the bed and I was screaming to my wife uh, that was in the bathroom. I said, I know what we're gonna do. We're gonna, we're gonna be fine. We're gonna grow cannabis and life is gonna be awesome. And 
you know, don't worry about it. Like things are going to be just fine. And so we really then started embarking on this whole new journey of cannabis, you know, um, it's interesting when we look at what we're kind of going through today with people's equality and, and racism and, you know, it's kind of weird, but I, we feel that same racism in cannabis, you know, here we want to bring something to the nation that's good for everybody. And every time we get up and speak out or turn around or we're being judged and it's kind of interesting. It's like, why, why don't I have my product in New York? Why don't I have my product from Oregon in LA? You know, uh, the state here has passed all the rules and regulations that it's gonna take for us to export to you. But we're shut down uh, on a national uh, federal level. So, mm. you know, again, you know, here I got everything that everybody wants and I can't share it with anybody. We're in an interesting position. That is interesting. Um, so, so tell me, yeah. Oh, no, I was just going to say, so uh, here we are jumping up and down the bed and um, we decided to get into cannabis. That was seven years ago. And it took us two years to fill out the application that would allow us to have a cannabis dispensary in the county that we are in. And then we went through all the hurdles of land and lux and uh, a change in environment from medical to recreational uh, and mix of those two systems. And uh, every time we turn around, guys, it's a new challenge every day. Something always hits us. And it's been like that for seven years. Uh, that said, uh, what I feel that Oregon has now is Oregon has a beautiful recreational cannabis program that I think should be modeled everywhere in the United States. Like they really have figured out all the road uh, bumps. And, yes, it and it's ready. That's awesome. So um, that's, that's what I was going to ask you a little bit more on. Um, can you expand on exactly what you do within the cannabis industry? You guys have a, a farm. Um, yep. You guys have a dispensary. What, what else? Yep. <laughs> yeah. So we are in every aspect of the cannabis industry. Um, we started it, from what we know now um, and what we should have known before we jumped in. Uh, I probably wouldn't have jumped as deep as I did, but I didn't have anything to learn from. It wasn't created yet. So and that's really where Full Spectrum Solution Group was born, was all the things that you need to do to actually be in the cannabis industry, you know, from a security system that you can plug and play to uh, insurance that you would need to to mark that check mark off that you got slips, trips and spills and product liability or crop coverage uh, insurance to point of sale systems with API functions that talk to the state and to the largest cannabis tracking software uh, in the United States. Um, there's a lot to this. And so as we went down this real bumpy road, we made a lot of friends. Can you, can you talk a little bit about some of the challenges that you've had, like you're saying about, about this bumpy road and then maybe some of the places where you, you know, the successes that you, that you had? Yeah, so um, I believe every failure, there was a, uh, there was, sorry about that. No worries. Um, uh, I believe in every failure, there was a success. And what I mean by that is we learned something that we would make sure that wouldn't happen next time. So that's how you got to kind of chalk it up because you spend a lot of money failing and learning in this business uh, when you try to sell cannabis uh, from when you grow it to where you sell it. Um, some of, and like to, to name off challenges, I've got stories all day long from people trying <laughs> yeah, to rob it to you know, people having a domestic dispute on the, on the highway right out in front of our business and almost running into our building uh, to um, every challenge you could imagine, uh, people trying to steal from you or scam you or uh, mislead you. Uh, it's, you have to be on your game, hands down, or you'll get taken advantage of. 100%. That totally makes sense. So if I understand it correctly, 
the, you know, your, your company in general is basically a how to guide for people trying to get in to get started within the cannabis industry. No, actually it's, um, seven years in this, you tend to find friends in this industry that are doing what you you're a part of, right? So for instance, uh, Raja at OMMPOS, uh, he has a software program and he writes the program that communicates for taxation and um, metric compliancy when it, when it comes to tracking cannabis. And we've been with him so long and we were able to build certain things and do certain things over the years together to stay on top of it or in front of it where now he, his company's ready for nationalization, right? Uh, if you look at our retail dispensary model, the things that we've had to do in that small mom and pop model, uh, we learned how to compete with the big conglomerate up the street mm. and stay in business. Uh, in the grow, we've learned how to track and drill down to become the most efficient that we could possibly be to grow the cannabis that we grow. Um, to bring to market and that's where it makes us a small boutique grower that's uh, really trying to compete in a very competitive industry with a lot of extremely talented people that I've met that grow cannabis uh, and to be able to keep up in that conversation or have a strain that we represent that uh, gets any type of notoriety it's a, a definitely a feather in your cap and it's a small group and you you strive to be a part of that. And so it's sure fun when we get to meet those people and be a part of those groups. It's really exciting. Gotcha. So you guys as a you guys as a company, I mean, you guys basically allow people to be compliant within the industry, correct? Yeah, we have teamed up with companies or we've developed a software that allows you to operate and stay in compliance. Um, the, if you were working your store and you went through everything that it took for raising money to working the counter, I guarantee you probably know every rule and regulation out there. Like you mm -hmm. just do, it's what you have to go through. It's the journey. But what puts us out of bounds is the employee, the guy that you put in just one little part of your business that he forgets to do something. And the next thing you know, you're out of compliance and that's upwards of a $6,100 fine. And if you get three of them in a row, they take your license. So imagine having millions of dollars invested in something and an employee doesn't do something correctly. And now your license is at jeopardy. Yeah. And that, that was a huge thing that we were, were tackling. Okay. And, uh, you know, the, the show Bush of Politics actually started in part because of cannabis. Um, Jason and I, after the 2016 election, we're in a, let's say a bad place. Um, and uh, we would uh, watch the news every night and roll, a, roll a, a, a joint and smoke and talk about just how ridiculous the world was getting. And so I, you know, and, and uh, we're really excited to have you on because in so many ways, cannabis contributed to the discussions that we would have. And then, you know, the show that, that turned, that grew out of those discussions. That's called the Europia effect. What's that? That's a, a, a good strain, a good, a good THC, a good CBD, a good turpin with a, a great friend and you get a very aerobic uh, experience. All right, there you go. Um, I, my, I, I was wondering how uh, COVID, how's the, how the pandemic has impacted your, <laughs> your business at all. I mean, if there's been an impact or, or if you've seen any changes. Oh yeah, man, we've seen crazy, craziness. So we'll, we'll kind of break it down like this. Everybody's going through this COVID thing. And I would, I would say us cannabis guys are going through the exact opposite spectrum of it. And that is, is that here we're considered a essential worker with absolutely zero federal support. We don't have banking. We don't have medical plans. We don't have 401ks. We don't have, uh, uh, any type of federal relief, um, our state allows us to be open. Um, and you gotta, you gotta realize like we handle cash because we have no banking, but yet they want to take cash away. Right. So you want us to be open, but now you don't want us to handle cash. And 
in our little shop, we service a couple hundred people a day and um, from people all around the world. Mm. And uh, knock on wood, thank goodness, nothing's come, you know, we, there's been no outbreak, but man, we're on the front line of it, right? Yeah. And, you know, we have the barriers, we have the social distancing in place and people wearing masks. And if you don't come into the establishment, we provide a mask if you need one. Uh, we were on top of this thing when this thing came down. I would say in three days, we had social barriers up. We were open for business because of what they expect us to do at the Oregon Health Authority and OCC and Boley and OSHA, where the cannabis industry responded immediately so we could keep our doors open. And then, you know, and what's crazy is that what we're seeing now, four months later, is stuff we implemented in two days. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're on a total opposite side. And the other side of that is you look at stimulus checks, you look at unemployment, you look at, uh, you know, where they're telling people to stay at home. It has driven our numbers up. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, we didn't, we couldn't take the PPP loans. We couldn't go for uh, the stimulus $600 a, uh, a bonus check thing. But I, I, with our sales, we got a little bit of all of that. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have to go for a loan. Uh, we just had to be open and be safe and keep our people safe. Well, that's, that's good to hear that, you know, at, at the very least during depressing times, people like to smoke and, you know, that's good for you. Yeah. And I think everybody should be smoking. And I don't mean that in a way like everybody needs to go toke on a joint, but you need to use some topicals. Are we, are we uh, lost you, Ryan? No, are you, am I back? Uh, yeah, you're you back. Need to use some, you need to use some topicals. You need to do some edibles. You need to just relax. And this natural plant that's been around for 10,000 years can do that for us. But yet we have barriers. And it's, it's got to be really frustrating on your guys' end. We're, we, we have an abundance of it. You have an abundance of what? Cannabis. They have abundance oh, of what? Can cannabis, yeah. Ah. yeah. We're around a lot of pot. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. That, that's awesome. I mean, that <laughs> sounds like a dreamland. I, 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 I had a quick question about um, the war on drugs. You know, yes. are, are you for or against? No, I, I was wondering, uh, I, I, I feel like in, in a place like New York State, you know, New York State was the first state to pass yeah. what, we, what we would know as the war on drugs, this raft of penalties for, for possession uh, mandatory minimums, things like that. So do you see, do you see like certain states is not legalizing up until it becomes nationally legal? Or do you well, think it'll still be the sort of piecemeal state by state sort of legalization? Yeah, everybody's going to pass their own little rule, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's obviously going to happen. And every, and every state needs to do that. They need to take, uh, you need to take control of your own state legislation, and then you need to drill it all the way down to a state and, uh, uh, a city and county ordinance is how far it drills down and you need to come together as a collective group if you want something really cool like what's awesome is measure 91 in Oregon when it was passed it was great when it passed because it allowed everybody to own four plants right it told you how much you could have on your possession it told you these certain outlined rules and regulations to grow cannabis without prosecution. And then it explained it for the medical industry and then we licensed up for the retail industry. What this did was when an officer now goes through your door and he's, he, he's there because of a domestic violence call, he can see in the backyard you got four plants, mm -hmm. but, but you're not going to jail for them because you're within the limit, right? So that's where the the program has been really successful for Oregon when we put a plan like that together. And, you know, the people that would grow six plants instead of four plants, they would now get a ticket for it. They don't go to jail for it. Yeah. You know? Okay. So, so was, I mean, yeah, no, no, please. Yeah. So when we talk about policing, uh, you know, I haven't met a cop that wants to bust me, right? He wants me to do my job is what he wants me to do. He wants me to keep it away from children. He wants me to card people and make sure that we give it to the right person. They want to make sure that we sell the proper limits uh, to people. So you, 
y yes, it's a it's that part of the policing's great. The fact that something's spelled out as an action plan is great. It clears a lot of stuff up. And then you'll always have that guy that's going to push the envelope. That's just human nature. And uh, those guys, yes, yeah, should be prosecuted because they're not doing what I have to do to be legal. And so they give me an outlet to be legal, but I have to pay for that legality. So for somebody to go out and not pay for that, that doesn't ring good in my book because I'm paying to do it right. You should pay it to do it right and, you know, figure it out. But they give, you, they give us a way to do it, right? Okay. Uh, I mean, from, from the I, – I had a bunch of questions for you, Ryan. But, I mean, just to, just to that point, would you say that the amount that it takes to become legal and, the, like, the hoops that you earlier described, doesn't that cut out a lot of the little guys? Well, I'm or a little guy. that would be growers? I'm a would-be grower, man. I started in a closet and a dream. And I don't think I, – I think um, what what's messed up is that I, I wish I could have gone down to my local bank with a business plan and, and submitted it to them because today we're debt-free and we recorded a $16,000 profit last year. That doesn't sound like a lot, but we we made it. Mm -hmm. we're, we're really happy and comfortable now. We don't, we don't have to invest in our infrastructure. Uh, that was a ton of reinvestment that we had to do. It would have been really a lot easier if I could have went to the bank and, you know, bought a piece of property through the bank and took out a hundred thousand dollar loan to build a grow. And, you know, yes, Mr. Banker, I'm going to, here's my business plan. And, you know, we're going to make this happen. You know, uh, I could build business plans all day long that look successful on paper, but, the fact that there's no cannabis banking, you're done. So um, I would always want to see the little guy always have the opportunity. He just he needs to have a really good business plan to succeed. Understandable. And that kind of draws me into my next question for you. Given that there's no real, like, like you said, um, you had to go through hoops to jump through, you know, and finally make your business legal within Oregon. Um, but there's no real, it's not legal nationally. So you, nope. as someone who grows in Oregon, even, you know, you, you couldn't ship to me here in New York. Nope. Are you, would you be allowed to ship to someone in say California where it's also legal or so, do different state regulations really block the interstate transfer? For, from what how, I understand. How, how regulated is it? Yeah. From what I understand, the only only industry right now that could get it from here to you uh, without breaking federal law would be a railroad because they own all the land uh, on the rail. So there's no, there's no uh, state boundary, right? When you open, when you own open rail. So that was one thing they figured out. Um, I, I don't think it's the, the real problem here is, entrenched legislation from 1932 and um you know prohibition man like it's it's just time to to unschedule this and unwind it and make it available for everybody there's people holding that up obviously. right right <clears throat> i mean i think that one of the i from my perspective i think one of the um you know probably some of the uh most the, the biggest proponents of prohibition are people who profit from its continued illegality. Um, yeah, and so you gotta realize it takes big big business to position, right? So they're making moves on a state level where you know they paid millions of dollars in lobbying money as a tobacco farmer, and then now tobacco's bad, so they, got, they need a new crop. And so they're making deals to be one of the top three producers in a state that produces all the cannabis for that state. And, you know, uh, so there's deals like that being made. That, that's the stuff that we really need to fight against because don't you guys want to have really beautiful cannabis that I grow here in Oregon available to you in New York and Florida and L.A.? I mean. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be nice. It's an yeah, open I farmer's market. You, you want to be available to that. So got to be careful what we, we, we vote for and how we get cannabis legal. Because I, if I you, completely understand. 
I, yeah. I completely agree with that because I mean, you know, as a, as a person who appreciates cannabis, one thing I don't want to see after, you know, let's say it does become legal nationwide. I don't want to see a standardization of crops. I don't want there to be a Marlboro cigarette of cannabis. I want well, each individual <laughs> grower to be able, you know, I, I like yeah. the variety that exists. Yeah, and there's, and I, I and I believe in this uh, vast, huge cannabis network, there is room for both, right? <clears throat> and that will be the difference of an outdoor flower that, that produces eight, eight to 10% and they, they manufactured into a 20 pack cigarette that you can pull out of a vending machine and it works nationwide because it's controlled THC volume. You'll have that design that's already here. But what you really want to get your hands on is the Cuban cigar model where somebody's taking pride in everything they do to make that product as best they can. And it represents them in a way of farmer that cares and puts everything boutique. he has boutique. into it. Boutique, boutique. exactly, yeah. Uh, we and, have, and, we, oh, sorry, go ahead. And we have people that line up for that for our store. They, they look for that at Bernie's. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we have some audience questions. Uh, I, just a question to our audience. If you have questions for Ryan, if you uh, want to comment on something that's been brought up in this discussion, we invite you to write it in the chat. Um, a question from Susan is has big business and the ability to patent strains impacted your business and how you compete? Uh, no, but they're definitely, the, what, what's happening is that the industry is being shown for somebody that does it on a commercial level and then there's somebody that does it on a boutique level. Um, the boutique level, there's just a noticeable difference in quality and price. And so uh, in our store, we carry a couple of guys that are super reasonably priced, but then what we'll find is our customer still wants that boutique hand rolled perfection. Just can't buy 20 of them. You can buy one of them and then he can still get his, his pack of Indica uh, pre-rolls and he makes it through the week. Mm -hmm. So we see smart consumers uh, really seeing how much cannabis they need to use in the week. And then they, they had try to afford that budget and get the best they can. Great. Um, did, yeah. I, did I answer your question? Yeah, I, 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 I think so. Um, if, uh, if anyone else has questions for Ryan, please let us know. Um, Jason, you have more questions for Ryan? Yeah, actually. So, I mean, I, I wanted to get your stance on kind of weed as a, as a political issue. I mean, do you see is it, a, it as a political issue? Uh, yeah, absolutely. When you talk about we can create a million new businesses and roughly anywhere from two to five million new jobs uh, in the near future and create taxational bases of upwards of 20 to 24 percent for every gram that we sell, uh, why are we not taking advantage of a 53 trillion dollar market, potential market? I mean, it's a good question. Why, why do you think we're not we're not taking advantage of it? They're trying to they're trying to figure it out so they can get paid, hmm. and they don't want guys entrepreneurs, uh, you know, rising through these ranks. Like, you got to realize, we found a, a way around banking, right? That does not make bankers happy when you do that. I don't need to go to a bank now. I have a a, a network that I can work in that can help us uh, expand our goals. And I pay them the percentage and uh, we work out a term and an agreement and it's a beautiful thing and it works. And uh, they watched money work locally. They watched local success happen. Uh, that, that's an amazing, that's what banking used to be about. It's not about that anymore. But now, you know, you have these, you know, multimillionaires that are going, where's the best place to put my money right now? And, and that's one place they're putting it is in the cannabis market, the private cannabis market. Mm -hmm. And, that was going to be my next question for you, actually. Um, you know, given, like you said, um, now it's becoming a competitive space for multimillionaires. Do you still think that the small time growers stand a chance given, like you said, that, you know, laws, it will become, you know, legal nationally eventually, but yeah, the next people two years. who control that are really shaping the game 
to benefit them. Do you think that I small business stands a chance? Oh yeah, totally. I mean, you look at companies like Microsoft, they started in a garage too. You know, it's what's your, what's your ambition? All you have to do is create a candy bar that's infused with cannabis that everybody loves and you will not be able to make enough candy bars. You'll be bigger than Hershey. Okay, that, that's the reality of what one product can do in this industry if you do it right. So when big business gets into this, they just focus in these really powerful sectors and there's just so much room for growth. We, we're only focused on 1% of the plant right now uh, and there's 99% of the plant they're leaving on the table. And, and we haven't even started talking about that yet. Talk about so it. So the, the industry is huge. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd love to hear a little bit more about it. Could you expand on that? I mean, obviously everyone's focused on the flower because that's what you roll up. But what else can so I mean, if you look at, you if you look at the fan done? leaf, yeah, if you look at the fan leaf that you pull off the plant every single day just in grooming, it's got more antioxidants and more protein than kale. So why aren't we all eating five to six plant leaves a day? You know, here, here we grow the cannabis and then cut it down and do it again. And meanwhile, it produces fan leaves every single day. And we're not consuming those. We can't get them into our supermarket. And then we talk about the stems. Stems have a, again, great THC, CBD, CBN, CBV, G compounds that you can put into a holistic tea. You know, we look at how many coffee drinkers they are and like, I'm watching farmers burn these, this stuff in the fields. When we talk about the roots of the plant, um, good God, it's, uh, it, it's amazing what it does in a crushed powdered form for the body. And we're not taking advantage of any of that, mm. very little. Wow. Well, I mean, we've obviously seen the effects of the lobbying of, you know, big tobacco and, you know, hopefully going forward, people can just get behind the legalization and we don't see, um, you know, the quality drop and we actually do see more usage of the whole plant. Yeah, we need to see that. We need to see entrepreneurs. Uh, we need to see in inventors and, um, you know, we really need to expand the use of what this plant can really do for us. Straight up. Yeah. Uh, are there any other audience questions before we need to wrap up? Oh, okay. All right. Um, I, 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 my last question for you, Ryan, is, you know, there's, in New York and New Jersey, there were efforts for legalization uh, in the past couple of years. And what, what, was, what hobbled them was not necessarily big business. It was actually members of the assembly, members of these different state houses who were saying that legalization didn't promise enough to communities of color that have been disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs. So I'm just wondering yeah, so you know, when, when, when legalization does happen, you know, is that going to be a factor in, in, in legalization? Well, yeah, so in legalization, what needs to happen on your state level is that when you put your taxation base together, you got to talk about these social groups and these these things that need to be repaired in your atmosphere for one, because you're creating crazy amounts of money and you can squash those little things that are such a big deal. Mm -hmm. Okay. That said, uh, again, that's where you got to get involved and point the money in the right direction. And I mean, how do you how do you suggest doing this? I mean, from you know, from your perspective as a grower, um, you know, how would you suggest making sure that this desire becomes policy? Well, that's where you got to stand up and speak out and get a part of it. You got to be a part. You got to your voice has to be heard, especially as a grower or a retailer. I oh, know. He's in Oregon, man. Oh, no. He's in Oregon, man. He's probably between like eight mountains. Ryan, you're slowing down, bro. We can't hear you. <laughs> oh, this is, this feels like a science fiction movie. Man, we've been. <laughs> because if you're not, then nothing's going to change. 
Uh, Ryan, uh, can you hear us, Ryan? Can you hear me? It was it was it, your image slowed down. You and, and your audio you paused. Hello, hello. Uh, we, we can, can hear, hear you. Now. Just here, we can't see you yet. I can hear you. There, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you yeah. better. Oh, there we go. Okay, much better. Am I back? Yeah, you're back. You're back. Go, go Sorry, back guys. like sixty seconds. Go, yeah, rewind like sixty seconds. You're we good. do. We just want the last sixty seconds of what you just said. Oh my God, that's where I went off. <laughs> <laughs> you guys do. You guys must not have wanted to hear it. <laughs> okay, so we have to be stood up. We got to stand together. We need to communicate. We have to be heard. Because if they don't hear what we're saying that makes us be able to work from day to day and operate, then nothing's going to change. So we have to be active. Got to be heard. Got to be heard. Well, thank you. Heard. Thank you so much, Ryan. Thank you for your time today. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks Very guys for having me on. You. Very much appreciate you. Thank you so much, Ryan, David. Really, got, really appreciate you guys thank coming you, on David. to the show, making it awesome. Uh, and, uh, yeah. Oh, we'll no, I, I, I was going to say, uh, I was going to say for the, for our audience members who are listening, you know, one great, if you continue to enjoy Bush Politic, one great way to support would be to contact a friend of yours, tell them about how, this great thing that happens every Thursday night and to bring a friend to our show next week. Uh, Jason, yeah, I, can I say one thing? Oh yeah, sure. Uh, I think Nicole, who is a black dispensary owner in Indianapolis has been gracious enough to jump on and I gave her kind of late notice and she really was looking forward to kind of hearing from Ryan. I just wanted to let her know, kind of acknowledge her mm, um, sure. and all the Thank things you. she's doing. She's doing a lot of stuff and I just wanted kind of Ryan to say maybe hello to Nicole if possible. Yeah. Say hi to Nicole. <laughs> Nicole, hey yeah. Nicole. Hey, can you guys hear me? <laughs> Nicole, yeah, thanks so much for joining us. Perfect, you're perfect, Nicole. Perfect. Well, thank, you. thank you for the and, and little. I, and I just gotta, I gotta preface this real quick. 